Hey, welcome to Thursday Night Live, the show where I get to relive my childhood, sing a Sesame Street song, and get to know some of the fabulous people around our community. Glad you've joined me. Remember this tune? To protect and serve. Our police don't have an easy task at the best of times. Try throwing a pandemic in when everybody is stressed, everybody is frustrated, so many are tired, alone, um, mental health issues are on the rise, and life has just been kind of turned upside down on us. These are the realities facing our police every single day when they go to work. So I want to have a chat with three friends of mine, Sean and Chris and Andrew, who are local policemen, and uh, they serve and protect uh, us. And just give them a chance to uh, open the playbook, what life is like, what um, the stresses and struggles are that they're facing, uh, how life is for their family, what made them want to do this, this kind of work, and uh, how are they doing in the midst of the circumstances we find ourselves. Um, if we're going to love our neighbors, I contend that we have to know who they are and what they're facing. So let's take a listen tonight to three friends of mine as we talk about the life of a cop in 2021 right here in Woodstock. Here's our conversation. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, we're glad you joined us tonight. Thanks for uh, coming out to Thursday Night Live. And um, I want to let these three guys introduce themselves. Tonight, we're talking to police in our area. And we're going to ask them lo lots of stuff about what they do, but mostly about who they are. Because I think behind every um, job is uh, real people and a real person. And that's what we want to get to the heart of in each of these episodes is who are the people in our neighborhood? Sesame Street, are we good guys on that? You want to sing it? <laughs> uh, it's been a few years. White chuckles. <laughs> Chris is the youngest. He probably remembers it the best. We could sing it. Yeah. AJ can lead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll save that for the ending. All right. Um, why don't you guys, would you take a minute to introduce yourselves? Why don't we start with you, Sean, and just tell us a little bit about yourselves and um, yeah, whatever you want to say. Perfect. Well, first, thanks for having, for having us on here. Uh, it's always great to raise, raise awareness. Uh, my name is Sean Kimball from Woodstock, born and raised here. I've uh, been a member of the Woodstock Police since 2009. Right now, I'm currently serving as the community resource officer, so that's in community events, uh, the schools. I also will uh, take part in some patrols, or, uh, and that's built that. So as far as the police world, I've been only working in Woodstock my whole career. So, so cool. And uh, I, I believe you have a family that stands behind you, right? Yes, if they'll, they'll admit it. Uh, my wife, Cindy, I have three kids, Caden, uh, Mally, and Lenny. Uh, they're all at Golden Mexican Cake School, 10, 6, and 8. And uh, you might hear them in the background there. They're here with me today. All right, cool, cool. Um, I think, AJ, we're going to go to you. It looks like Sorensen is frozen somewhere in the deep woods of New Brunswick. Uh, so he's actually heading uh, to... Uh, the, a different work site today in, in Moncton region, I think. So if he comes and goes on us people, uh, let's just, let's just blame it on Chris. Okay. But AJ, go ahead. Uh, awesome. Thanks for having us, Neil. Um, I am Andrew Whiteway uh, as anybody in Woodstock would, re would remember me, but I think that in my past, I was so such a, a good student and child here in the area. I had to go to an alias, um, I taught overseas for a few years, and a lot of my students overseas couldn't say Andrew. It was always Andalou. So I switched back to AJ, which is what my family always called me. It's kind of one of those, um, you know, just those names that rem reminds me of my family, and it's, it's kind of stuck with that, and it's a little easier writing out. We do enough paperwork so I can shorten anything I can. Gotcha. Um, I'm from Woodstock, the same as Sean. I was born and raised and graduated high school here. Um, I've been with the RCMP. Uh, since 2009, I was in BC for five years, um, and uh, we, we came home, my wife and I uh, moved home, uh, had sick family members, and came home to be with them, 
Um, the RCMP was pretty good to get us back here. I spent uh, a year and a half or so in Nackwick or Mukto, that area. And then finally was able to come up to Woodstock where we've been. Uh, both our kids were born uh, up here and uh, good Carlton County stock. <laughs> and uh, so they, uh, they go to uh, Meduxin and Keg as well. Um, my daughter just turned eight and my son is six and uh, my wife teaches at Townsview. So we're pretty embedded in the community here and uh, we're looking to stick around and stay here. As you know, um, I think things are a little different in the RCMP. You don't have to kind of move around as much as you used to if you don't want to. So we're, we're pretty happy here. So um, yeah, so that's kind of us in a nutshell. Awesome. Sorensen, do you think we can uh, get you to say the words? Are we going to be able to hear you? Can you hear me now? How am I sounding? We can hear you, man. Perfect. I'm not too far out. Um, my name is Chris Sorensen. Uh, I've been a RCP officer for 13 years. Uh, originally stationed to Alberta, New Brunswick, Red Deer, or Alberta, New Brunswick, Alberta, uh, Red Deer for about four years. Then I took a transfer up north to Nunavut or to a town called Pond Inlet. I was there for about two years and I went to uh, Iqaluit and uh, I wanted to come home. So I decided to come to Woodstock, New Brunswick. I was lucky enough from Grand Falls, close enough to home. Um, currently, I'm with the crime reduction unit in Woodstock uh, in a plain clothes capacity. And I'm currently seconded to the uh, provincial drug unit. Um, I've got a wife, Kate, and uh, three kids, uh, Jack, who's 10, Ella, who's eight, Oli, who just turned four. So uh, pretty hectic. And uh, hopefully I can stay with you guys today and not lose service out here on the road. Well, it's, it's, uh, we can hear you fine right now. Uh, your face looks all kinds of interesting at different times as the video cuts in and out, but just, uh, just know that we're enjoying that. Okay. <laughs> so let's jump in with just kind of a each simple question. What made you want to be a cop? Nobody can jump right on it. Nobody wants to. Well, <laughs> next question. Nobody really wanted to be a cop. Well, once NASA rejected my application, I guess policing was my next choice, I guess. Nice. <laughs> was that a hard no or was that the yeah. deliberate on that? It was a, it was a hard no. <laughs> so I guess I joined, I guess I joined uh, by, uh, young. I was only 19. I kind of want to get out there and make a difference. Um, you know, I had neighbors that were cops and I didn't want to be stuck in an office. So, I mean, my office now is on the road dealing with people. So it's kind of why I want to join. White way. Yeah. It, part of that is the same. I mean, it's, um, the nine to five, you know, I, I had parents that both were, you know, that the nine to fivers and did that, you know, office work and stuff. And I saw that and I saw, you know, the highs and lows of that. And it kind of, it never really appealed to me. I mean, I, here in the community, I worked everything. <laughs> Sean, Sean, I remember, I mean, we've done, I think every job from working at Sears when it was here to Canadian tire to, I, I think I, even, I did a summer at the Red Cross and everything and just nothing ever really was like, Hey, that's, this is where I, I want to go forever, you know? And um, <clears throat> like Chris said, um, I think it takes a certain type of person when you're drawn to, you know, kind of serve and, you know, whether it's in the community or whatever, you know, whether nurses, doctors, firefighters, you know, anybody even, you know, it's, it, you have to kind of want to, to serve and to, uh, it's a lot of sacrifice. And it's, it took me a little, I'm the opposite in the spectrum from Chris, because I didn't uh, get into the RCMP till I was 30. Um, and, and then that's only a couple of years ago. Right. So, <laughs> ish. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I think I was just kind of drawn to, I wanted to do something to, you know, make a difference and, and, and help in some way and give back. Um, you know, to a community that, you know, they, they're a lot of, from minor sports to, you know, activities and, and things around the community that I always grew up seeing and doing. And it's, you know, I, I guess I was just kind of drawn to like wanting to serve and give back and, and to help out. So, um, and you get to, you know, drive a really cool car and, and do lots of stuff like that. So it's, yeah, it's all about, all about the car. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sean Kimball, any, uh, any, was this a childhood dream for you or is this like, uh, 
A uh, little bit of both, just to echo on those guys too. It's uh, about being involved in the community. Um, tried different jobs. I didn't get into policing until 30 also, and nothing really caught on. And uh, I like being involved with the community, like being involved with people. And uh, that's kind of why I wanted to do the section that I'm in with the Woodstock Police now as the community resource officer, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, going to school, ta having kids, helping out with the lunch breakfast, uh, at the school or uh you know taking that shift to, to work the cover the shifts um, just being involved with the community really cool um aside from being a, a police officer what do you guys love doing like tell just a little bit about you what are your hobbies or what are your what's your family life like what do you guys do in your your off time I see you grinning, Andrew. I think we'll maybe let you hold that answer. We'll go to Kimball. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, just tell us like the real person you behind the uniform that we don't necessarily see uh, in your Well, I could probably echo uh, Chris there. Most of our free time is spent at the, uh, the arena during the winter. Uh, Chris and I both helped coach three different hockey teams in our community and then uh, another team for the Valley. So, uh, I think the only night we have off during the week is Thursday night, and that's when we go play our own uh, pickup hockey. So hockey is a big part of uh, my life. Um, I like it hockey for myself, but it also creates a good uh, bridge with the kids. Um, you know, when a police officer, like uh, I guess when I walk into a school, there's uh, kids that will wave because they, they don't say, hey, police officer. They say, hey, there's Coach Sean. They see the two combined, and I think that's a, a great connection for kids in our community. And then as they go up uh, a few years, I've been coaching for six or seven years. So now that they're reaching the middle school age, they, they kind of have that connection. There's not that awkward or silence in the police. They're, if yeah. there's something bothering them, they're able to come uh, talk to us. Um, so that's part of it, hockey. Uh, so there's a lot of running the roads with three kids with that. Uh, in the summer, we just like to lounge around and take it easy. Uh, my youngest, or my boy Cades, starting up minor ball. So don't know a lot about ball, but I help out there some too. Uh, so we try to stay, stay busy there. Sorensen. Well, like Sean said, um, most of the time we're spent at the rink, uh, three kids all playing hockey and, you know, I guess with them playing, I have, volunteered my time to, to help coach. So yeah, like Sean said, we, I, I basically live at the rink. It's rush home from work, uh, get a little bit of food in the kids. And then, then, uh, we live at the rink. So, and, and to that point, uh, there's not much free time, but I don't think we, or I would want it any other way. Um, I enjoy being out there, uh, with the kids, uh, I mean, I'm not in the schools like Sean is. I'm probably furthest away as possible. But uh, just knowing that the, the kids, you know, that we do coach know that we are approachable, um, that we're not just a police officer um, in their eyes kind of thing. And, and maybe later on that builds some kind of trust with the kids um, that we coach. So uh, besides that, um, in the summertime, Kids enjoy swimming and uh, we enjoy camping. So uh, that's summertime is kind of a relaxed time. Uh, whereas winter, we, we, I guess we don't have a life because we're always on the road, but wouldn't want any, any other way kind of thing. So, Andrew, you guys, tell us about the. You guys both had a chance to just drop the side of this thing in, like about, like, you know, how awesome your wives are there and you know, how they're so understanding about this time at the rink and you drop the ball. <laughs> Cameron can play hockey too. Just saying. Oh yeah. There we go. Okay. The, the shameless <laughs> hockey plug. Um, the, these guys know too. I, I've kind of tried to, you know, get involved a little bit in, in some coaching and helping out uh, the last couple of years with like the minor basketball, the puppies, the little kids, which having, you know, 50 small kids under the eight, you know, like five and six year olds on a court is like herding cats this year obviously was a little bit different things go awry and um sean and chris would tell you too neil that it's it it makes what they do even that more impressive because with shift work and the call outs and the overtime and the stuff that we get drug into it, it's hard to commit sometimes to those things um 
I did a year or so in with the Rotary Club here, and then I kind of it kind of fell by the wayside. I really enjoy the stuff that they do and the work that they do here, but to stick to getting to meetings and events and stuff, and it's like, sorry, I'm working. Sorry, I can't get that time off. You know, it's that makes it hard. But uh, yeah. again, it's there's a lot of stuff in the community to give back and to do. Um, we kind of um, it's kids activities, you know, from skating to piano to um, basketball, hockey, whatever it is. And we've, our kids have tried a bunch of different stuff too. Um, there's, there's curling on right now. We've tried a couple weekends. Um, it ends up, you kind of become a slave to what, what are the kids doing? What are they trying? What are they, what are they playing? Um, and you know, sometimes in there, try and find some, some times for yourselves to get away for a weekend or something. But, uh, yeah, we're pretty much just the, we're in that full family mode too. And, uh, yeah, that kind of we what that we call fall prey to whatever that is, you know. It's uh, yeah. So how what's this last year been like for you guys? Um, you guys probably have a vantage point on this that not not everybody has, but I think all of us can certainly see that things have been rough. Things have been, um, but things have been very. Uh, it's been a polarizing kind of year. I think that's kind of it's driven a wedge between some people, some uh, maybe even organizations or people who serve like our communities um, and people like you guys and, and other people have taken some hits and taken some criticism. What's this year been like for you guys? Seems to kind of be one of those topics. It's like you, you can't discuss you know, religion, politics, or, Hey, how do you feel about wearing a mask? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think on one level, it's been, we've almost had kind of an unfair advantage because when so many people are stuck at home and told to do that, we're out, you know, like we're, we're out and, and, and it's a different world, but you know, we're out in the community. So I've noticed there's that escape and it almost seems kind of unfair. It's like, see you, sweetie, you know, good luck with the kids. I just, I really have to go to work. You know, they, they need me. Uh, I got to get out and so on that aspect, you know, we've had that, you, you get that break, right? You're not stuck at home all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's totally different. It, it's been tough with um, the, the changes. It's always changing. The landscape is always, you know, it's, we get emails like daily or weekly and it's like this information in public health. And so processing a lot, I mean, it's, we, and, and people are always, I, I get text messages and calls and like, Hey, do you know about this or what's going on this? Or are we orange? Are we red? What level? Sometimes we don't have the answers, right? We're just kind of flying by the seat of our pants on some of it too. Yep. Yep. Um, from my standpoint, um, can you hear me guys good or am I breaking up? You're good. Um, I don't have the fact like Sean or AJ would where they're more on the front line than myself, but, you know, from the aspect of what I'm doing uh, with the RCMP, um, I mean – our protocols are just the same as everybody else. Uh, mass, sanitize all the time. Uh, but as far as the involvement, I mean, I can't speak to what Sean and, and AJ have done or have done over the last year because I'm just not in the same role. But, uh, you know, we're doing what everybody else is doing, wearing our masks and obeying the, obeying the, the six feet and just trying to stay as safe as possible. So when you when you go to arrest somebody, you do that from six feet away. Then that's what you're telling us. Well, I usually get somebody else to do that. But uh, <laughs> make sure we understood. Yeah. Go ahead, Kimball. What's what's this year been like for you? Uh, like uh, these guys both said, it's been changes every week. What our what our routine orders are for uh, whatever the flavor of the week. Um, uh, but just the uh, you know. I think there's also been some uh, understanding of like uh, not just police, but all the frontline workers, how much they sacrifice each day, um, whether it's the grocery clerk or the, uh, the nurse at the hospital, like they still have to deal with life goes on, right? We still have to deal, just you know, pre prepare yourself each day and, and take those steps to stay safe. What's been, have you seen a, a change in um, crime and like criminal activity around our communities. Um, Chris, you're working in the, the bigger picture, maybe the, the whole province in the, in the capacity that you're playing, but have you seen changes 
Um, has there been a less lesser amount or a different kind of activity going on or is it ramped up? What's it been like? I guess one of the things I was thinking about too, Neil, is like from, from general duty policing uh, you know, on the road and doing the day-to-day -day stuff is um, you see that spike. And I mean, it, there, there's other factors, obviously, and I know that, but you know, whether it's in the schools and the church too, um, this year is taking a toll, I think, on people's mental health mm -hmm. and people who were struggling with that anyway. This is just something that's just kind of like, here's, here's another, here's something else to drop on you. You know, like now you're stuck at home or now your job isn't there or now, you know, like um, whatever it is, you're separated, divided from, you know, friends and family. And, you know, it, I have coworkers. We, I, we all do. We um, we have coworkers that live, you know, in different areas. We've got a bunch of people that are from Quebec, you know, people that haven't seen their families in a year and a half and can't with no foreseeable, you know, so, Hey, but you still got to come in do your job day to day. And, you know, so I, I can't imagine, you know, that's from our perspective, you know, but, you know, Joe public and, you know, uh, I, I've, I've seen that definitely. And I've seen, you know, people that struggle. Um, and a lot of times, you know, when there's, you know, if it's problem A or problem B and there's something they can do and there's, there's an end in sight, <laughs> we're not there right now. We're, we don't have that end in sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has there been, Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say when the first uh, COVID first came, I, a lot of our calls uh, for thefts were down because everyone was home and no one was allowed out. Uh, they were kind of able to watch <laughs> yeah. their stuff. So there was that little initial drop in crime and then when everyone stayed home. Um, but just to touch base with the, the side of mental health, I know our, our calls for uh, mental health and, and even domestic have gone up too. Just the, the pressure uh, whether it's financially, someone was not able to work for the first little bit before they got the relief money, um, you know, or some people deal with the stress a different way, whether it's a mixture of drugs or alcohol, then that combined with a stressful situation. Uh, we had a lot of domestics and uh, a lot of uh, mental health work too. And uh, some of the resources people would have for mental health, whether it's uh, different committees or support groups, they were kind of shut down. So people were kind of isolated. And not a lot of people are fortunate to have uh, the technology like cell phones or even data or Wi-Fi at home that they could use to reach out to people. So uh, I think that was a big, uh, you know, factor into some of our calls, different ones or a spike in those, those type of calls. When you have people that are home 24 seven and they're, you know, they have been, they're transfixed to the news. So good, bad, or otherwise, whatever they're seeing, it's they're bombarded with it. And, you know, that's what they're carrying with them too. Right. Right. Yeah. How do you guys deal with that yourselves? Because in some ways, I'm guessing you probably don't have a choice. Like uh, it might not be uh, CTV news or it might not be CNN um, or the radio that's pumping the news into you, but you're getting a daily, a daily dose of uh, crime reported to you. Right. And that's what I gathered from what Chris said. Um, how do you guys process that? when you're just around dealing with crime as a profession in your 40 to 60 hour work week, whatever it might be. As far as the news, me personally, I don't watch the news. Uh, there's too much negativity. And that's like, uh, one thing with our job is we're seeing people uh, the worst time of their day, like the worst at their worst. So um, I try to keep things positive when I'm not at work. And the news to me seems to always be more negative. So uh, if I could just shut one avenue of negativity off, then, then that's what I do. And that's, that's just me though. You have to kind of step out of it, right? Like, I mean, it's, if people are angry at whatever it is, it's not necessarily you or me, you know, it's uh, it's, you know, they're angry at the uniform or the situation. And, and like Sean said, we see people at, you know, the percentage of people we deal with, but we deal with that, you know, one or 2% at their lowest level that they've maybe ever been. And it's, you know, sometimes it, you know, requires a certain response, but, you know, sometimes it's just like, hey, take five minutes and just listen and it helps. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned people are angry. Uh, I mean, that's, that seems to be growing, you know, around uh, just everything that's going on. There's a level of fatigue about the way life has been, but we, uh, we were certainly none of us are able to ignore just what's going on and what's what's happening and the way people are handling things. 
and you guys are on the front lines of that um, as much as anybody, I'm sure. And um, we, we won't go way down this rabbit hole, but um, this has been a year probably like, like no other where there's been a lot of anger uh, thrown at cops. What's that been like? That can't be fun. And how have you, how have you processed that? How have you, what's your perspective on, on some of these things? And love to hear from you. Anyone? <laughs> I want to throw the ball into your court there on that <laughs> Next, one. we to jump to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, well, <clears throat> not just news, but social media. Like, I mean, the internet can be an absolute sewer. It can be, you know, it can be a tool, but it can be garbage. And you just have to, I'm, I'm sure, is like any article on CBC, I don't even know if they allow a lot of stuff to people to post anymore, but you get the, the pro side and the con side and it's, it's hard to separate yourself. And I think that's why having a good solid base at home and having other stuff to do and come home to, and, you know, you can separate yourself from, from all that. That's important. Um, yeah. People are angry and it's, it, it's taken its toll and it's, you know, unfortunately it was one of the things I was taught you know, during training is like, there's certain days that you get paid to get yelled at, or unfortunately some days maybe you take a punch in the mouth and that's, um, those are the days you try and avoid, but, um, Again, it's just a, letting people vent and knowing that, you know, I, I didn't cause all this problem and I didn't, I didn't you know, create Corona and not something I concocted in my basement. <clears throat> I can barely make toast. <laughs> um, but uh, it makes a good bowl. Yeah, of chili. It, it's what you make a good bowl of chili. I've, I've been the benefactor on that. <laughs> <laughs> His skills are limited people, but he makes good chili. <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's a hard one to answer, I guess. Yeah. It, I've seen it. I've seen anger, but I've also seen the support side too. And, you know, there's, there's people that are out there that are, you know, um, that are thankful for what we do and that we're there and that, you know, we can, you know, and I think that's for those times when people come in and they say, Hey, what do you know about this? Maybe I can't tell them everything. Maybe I can't, you know, inform them of all the, you know, secret, trade secrets or whatever, but it's a little bit goes a long way sometimes too. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Uh, just to echo on AJ there, uh, the main thing is you have to have before you kind of, uh, whether it's on duty, have the mindset not to take things personal. Uh, like he said, people are frustrated and, and generally they want to vent. Um, also, you have to keep in mind that the, the negativity is just a handful of people. Uh, if you took a poll, the majority of the community supports, uh, supports the police uh, a great amount. Um, so you just have to keep that positive thinking and, uh, try not to take it personal, uh, that these people, they, they could be mad at, uh, their wives, husbands or landlords, but they're, they're taking it out on you because you're the one that showed up there and you, you have that interaction. So, um, most times you'll see the person, it's a small community. You'll see them the next week or so. And, uh, quite often, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll be good with you and, you might even get an apology once in a while. Not a lot, but <laughs> once mm -hmm. once in a while, because they they you'll be able to once they're dialed down. Like I'll even call the people. I was like, "Geez, you're in a better mood now." Yeah, what was up with you the other day? And then they'll they'll go down that story and explain a little bit, right? And so you just can't meet them head on uh, that day and uh, start a confrontation. Just let them vent, circle around the next couple of weeks, and say, "Hey, what was up there?" And most part, they'll they'll admit that they were a little offside. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how do you guys deal with, uh, maybe, maybe you've covered this a little bit, but how do you handle criticism? Um, you know, not only the angry people and, and the trolls who maybe jump on uh, with their digital courage and their keyboard warriors and they're talking about how horrible cops are and how they're all corrupt and they're all these things, right? Um, how do you deal with that? when um, you know each other and you know yourselves. And, and I, I know uh, some of you pretty well too. And uh, I mean, we even let Kimball come into our home. Like he brought his kid to piano lessons and sat in our living room. So, I mean, he must be okay. I mean, nothing bad happened <laughs> there, but like- You're allowed to 
Say if Sean's doing piano lessons, you're allowed to tell us that. Yeah, Sean, he's doing really well. You would you would not believe like he looks like a tough guy, but he's a softy when when the music plays. He, yeah, he just he's he's a crooner. Mozart. Yeah. But how do you how do you handle criticism? Um, cops of not just you guys here in Woodstock. I know I know you guys have taken some heat, and and I've I've uh, you know seen some of that happening around. And, um, but just worldwide, there's a, there's a hate on, yeah, at, there has been processing criticism and dealing with stress and wrongful things that are said. What do you do? Well, I think uh, myself, you have to have a, a good base yourself. You have to have something to relieve your stress. It's a very stressful job. Uh, whether it's well, I think uh, the- going for walks, working out. I got this, Chris, there. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try and I'm really trying, you, but uh, I'm you, really you delayed right now, now, I think. You, now. you go ahead. We can only finally hear you as so you take over. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it, it's frustrating because uh, what's being portrayed, uh, you know, may not be the truth. And, uh, the hardest part for us is not commenting ourselves on on facts that we may actually know about certain situations and holding it back to ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, on a lot of stuff that is put out there, um, it's it's you know maybe what the people want to hear, but it may not be the truth. So, I think you know for me, it's a good support at home. You know, it's it's your colleagues. A lot of faith that we have in our colleagues, but. Uh, you know, we, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes not to look at the messages that people do put out there, but I mean, and sometimes it is a hard not to, to comment on, on certain things, but you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you got to take the bigger approach to the situation and, you know, it's probably best not to be a keyboard, get into it, you know, be a keyboard warrior kind of approach and just, you know, suck up your pride and you know eventually hopefully the the truth does come out that uh you know on on certain articles that are put out to the people to read so are you telling me that not everything we see on the internet is true (laughs) (laughs) Um, i'm 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 not going to get into this debate right now uh, on that. Is that what you want me to believe? That's what I want to know. Not everything on Facebook or Instagram or even CBC, every single detail may not be in the post. Is that what you're telling us? Yes or no, Chris Sorensen? Uh, I, I, uh, unfortunately, I'm not going <laughs> to give you a defined answer on that. <laughs> well, um, it's to me. Is Elvis still alive? (laughs) Yes, somewhere I believe he is. Bigfoot does exist. (laughs) Well, you're on the road to Moncton, so you're probably you're liable to run into a Yeti along the highway somewhere there in the in the in the backwoods. So it's a possibility. Yeah, yeah. I think it's funny how we know that stuff. Like we know that okay, not every detail of what happened in this incident is in the news report or in what somebody posted on social media, but people get so caught up in wanting to be part of uh, the discussion and the gossip and the whatever it is that they do. And any of us could be susceptible to it. I'm sure it's tough to hold back though when when you guys have... (laughs) uh, the perspective that you have on on incidents that happen um, in our world and in our town. So um, it leads me to this. You, you, I think you all mentioned having a good support base at home. How does this affect your wives? Do you want to just take a second to sound off on their behalf? Because <laughs> they're I losing you. Them. I think I'm losing you. <laughs> 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 there, there must Can be. Can I check with mine first? <laughs> this is well, this is a good uh, way into another uh, <laughs> conference out there for them. <laughs> this is uh, there's an edit button on this after, but how how do your wives handle watching you guys go through tough stuff? I uh, I, uh, I think yeah. uh, I think they uh, they take it harder than us sometimes. 
because they see the toll that it, it puts on us and, you know, the negativity that uh, is shined on you us. So I think, I, yeah. think, uh, I think they actually take it harder than us. Yeah, it's, I've, I've seen situations where I'll read or see something and it's, uh, and I'm, I'm used to that, like, okay, it's, I'm just going to brush it off. And my wife will be, that's ridiculous. Why would they say that? Why are they doing that? Why isn't somebody saying something else? And it's like, well, that's, that's the situation for now. It's, um, what about your kids? What do they think about what you guys do? Uh, right now the, my kids are young where it's still, uh, they're not, uh, I can still keep them in my little bubble. So there's no, no issues that way. And they still think uh, it's a cool thing that dad does. Uh, come back to me in about five or six years once they uh, middle school and high school year, and we'll see how that goes. But uh, right now, it, it's uh, I don't share a lot with the kids. They say, "Ah, I dress any bad guys." Oh yeah, that, that's that's it. Uh, but as far as that, uh, I don't go into a lot of it with with them at this age. Yeah, kind of the same. Yeah, um, I guess in, terms of the, in the the coronavirus and the COVID being home and that kind of stuff, the current climate. Um, I, that, that's hard on me. I, I feel, I feel for them, you know, like uh, when this first started back in March and, you know, the kids would go to the end of the driveway and see their friends across the road and they, just, they don't understand, right. They can't, you can't No, you can't go play with your friends. You can't go over there right now. Like, I'm sorry. And then you get an explanation of like, no, you didn't do anything wrong. It's not your fault, you know, but so that was hard as a parent and, you know, take the police officer away. I mean, that's just, that's, that, that's one of the examples of what's hard on all of us too. Right. Because there's nothing you can do about it. Yeah. Have you guys ever wished, uh, like seriously wished, you could be just doing something else? Ever had any regrets about getting into this work? No, I'll, uh, I'll go first. No, I, I wouldn't uh, change my career choice uh, by any means. I wouldn't change the locations, uh, the people I've met. Uh, this, this career that I've taken with the RCP, it's taken me all over Canada, the experiences, uh, being able to work the Olympics, being able to see the North, uh, respond to calls where uh, the, you know, the subject of complaint was a polar bear kind of thing. Uh, where else would you get that, right? So, uh, and right now to be, you know, close to home, uh, and, and right now doing doing a, a job where you know I'm on the road and uh, on the road in a sense where I'm still home every night I uh, I wouldn't change a thing cool I'd say the same I you know I, I think I I like my status where I'm at I like the I like the you know the job still um, regrets hindsight's 2020 and a lot of stuff um, you know, I think that it's all, it builds who we are, right? You know, we are who we are based on the things that we've done and what we've seen. And, <clears throat> um, no, I don't think there's any regrets. I think it's, it, I'm happy at that where we're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Just echo with uh, what these guys said, I haven't had any polar bear complaints in Woodstock. Uh, that's where my career's been, but uh, <laughs> I, I like seeing how uh, my uh, ties with the community has evolved over the last 10, 11 years. Um, but, uh, and I like being involved with the community. So, you know, uh, every job has its challenges and I like to embrace those. So I, I, I wouldn't change much any, anything. We were just talking the other day, Sean, whatever came of the black bear, the black bears around Woodstock and the golf club complaints last year, did that ever, did they ever trap that guy or well, what? They, they had a trap behind their police station for quite a while. I think they, they got them. Um, and then the golf course, uh, snow came, so we'll see what comes here in the spring. What's what's gonna <laughs> what's gonna happen there? That was an interesting time. <laughs> we've got coronavirus, and we've got the bear down the street. So don't go don't go walking <laughs> for multiple reasons. <laughs> I know one of the reasons why bears. A couple of years ago, someone would always take their truck, and they'd have uh, uh, grease from one of the restaurants to help bait the the bear. Well, they the truck was empty, but they parked it in their driveway, so the bear tore the truck all to pieces all, climbed all over it because they could still smell it oh, so wow. if you're going to use a truck as a bait truck don't bring it back in town don't come back to town yeah oh, um you ever made any mistakes as a cop in your career 
Well, <laughs> ass. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a lot of learning experiences that we've had over our career. Uh, <laughs> but uh, any major, major mistakes? No. Uh, but, there, there, you know, we do make mistakes, uh, small ones, and we always learn from those. That's just part of being human. Uh, any profession, you're, you're going to make a mistake and learn from it and do it better the next time. That, that's from my side. It don't say. So you guys are human. Yeah, it's cool. I just thought your uniform was walking around. Hard, hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what is one thing you wish that people knew about cops in general, or you personally as a cop? What's one thing you just wish people knew? For me, I think you uh, led right into it. Just that uh, you know we are humans behind the badge, the uniform. We got families we want to go home to. And, you know, for me, my family is my top priority above the job. So um, that's where my line in the sand is. And that every officer wants to get home after that shift, whether it's to go to bed or see the family, get them ready for school. Um, that, that for me is the main thing is it, it's, it's what we do. But our, our main priority is to be a husband, a, a father to kids. That's beyond the badge and the uniform. For me, it's uh, like Sean said, uh, we're human. We've got family at home at the end of the day. Um, we have a job to do. Uh, our job is to enforce the law. Uh, and, uh, you know, everybody has a bad day. Um, everybody has a good day. And, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, we're all humans. So, uh, we just, we want to go home at the end of the day. We have a family and uh, just like everybody else. So unfortunately, the situations we see, we don't see people at their good. But uh, you know what? Everybody gets a second chance. And uh, we just don't want to be the cop Chris when we're not in uniform. We just want to be Chris kind of thing. So, well, wait, anything to add? We'll keep moving. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, for people to understand that we, we do the same things day to day and I'm a firm believer that, you know, and I think most people would say the same first impressions are a big thing, but mistakes get made and, and, you know, and you can, people can grow on you, people can change. And, um, like Chris said, is like, yeah, like people deserve that other chance. And a lot of the people that, you know, that we deal with sometimes, it's, um, it's a matter of, you know, hey, maybe there's somebody that I went to school with, or maybe there's a person that, you know, has a similar, you know, they have a wife and kids. Maybe they were only one or two decisions made differently away from where I am, you know? Um, so to, to put that human aspect to it and to understand who they are and like, yeah, I've got a job to do and I might be here to to arrest you or serve you this paperwork or follow up on something that is like the worst thing that's ever happened to you or your family. Mm -hmm. Somebody's got to do it. And you know, it, do I always want to do that? No, I wish I was talking to you on a different level. I wish we were, you know, at a ball game or, you know, I, I wish we were somewhere else, but sometimes it's just, it's not the case. Right. So I'm here to do this and that. And, and yeah, we're human. Um, I have a family like you and, and I, you know, but Am, am I a stone cold? Am I just the uniform? No, because I'm doing it because I care. And, you know, and, and maybe in some way, me being there to take your statement or me being there to, to help you with something is, you know, maybe that's that first step. You know, maybe that this we start from here and then maybe we move on and, and you know, get you in the right direction. It's every every conflict, I think, is kind of is an opportunity, you know, one way or the other. Right. And um, so I kind of try and take that with me when I'm dealing with people and you know, wh whatever their response might be, I can't change them all the time, but, you know. Um, maybe this final question, what's your great hope for our community, for the Woodstock area, or for the people that you serve? What's your great hope for them? And what is it that you need from us to, uh, <laughs> some question, stop breaking the law. But what is it that you need from your community as you do your job in order to do it well? And, and what's your great hope for our, our, the people that you serve? Uh, 
I guess to have uh, trust in us. Uh, uh oh, somebody else better. What was that? He cut off. That was going to be epic. That was. Gonna be <laughs> he was to something. Hopefully, he'll come back and share it. Can you freeze that face for uh, profile oh, picture? <laughs> there he is. Go you ahead, there you're back. Build trust. Go. Build trust. Build trust. The, 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 the moment. The it. moment's gone. The moment's gone. Yeah. Now. <laughs> no, never. It's going to be you, rehearsed once. Give it to us a second time. No, just have faith and trust in us, um, and support us on uh, on what we do. Um, you know. You, uh, that, that would be the biggest thing, I think, is just, uh, you know, support us. I think the support thing, that that's good, Chris, because I think that people don't understand. You often say, you ever have somebody that you maybe give them a compliment? They're like, oh, I had no idea. It's like, well, yeah, I'm on the outside looking in, you know, and as someone who's had the opportunity to go to school in different places and I've traveled all over the world, I've been in dozens of countries and, you know, and, and, you know, gone around the world and come back home and, and, you know, there's no place like home. I'm not going to click my heels like Dorothy, but I love it here. <laughs> and to be able to tell somebody from Carlton County, like, Hey, I, I know maybe you haven't been here, here or here, and you haven't seen this, this or this, but it really is a pretty amazing place. There's a lot here, you know, like there, there would be the naysayers that would, you know, uh, my, Sean's in the school. Sean can tell you, we've got some pretty good schools and good teachers here. And, you guys can both attest to, hey, we've got some good, you know, youth sports and stuff. And, you know, whether there's there's music here, there's there's things that are great about this community. And I think Chris is right, is that if people can get past a certain level and, and, and build that trust and see, I think for me, the thing that I'd like to see is that Joe Guy or Joe Public, you know, the difference that they can actually make just by uh, maybe even a little bit of input or a little bit of community service or a little bit of like, you know, there, there's a lot that could be done here. I think that we could we could really grow and it could be even better. Um, we're not without our problems. I know that. But, um, you know, everybody wants to, you know, and, they, and people will always come up to us as police officers like, oh, can you believe this? Or can you believe that problem? Or can, did you hear about this again? Like, yeah, but did, did you make a call? Did you talk to so-and-so? Did you? There's a lot of things I think people could, they could self-empower themselves, I guess, is, is kind of what I'd like to see, you know. And um, I always remember growing up, like what a sense of community there was here from, you know, whatever it might be, I, I always remembered that. And it's one of the things that brought me home, you know. Uh, the main thing is you touched with it. What can a community do? I think you have to come together as a community uh, overall, right? Uh, um, whether it's different agencies working together. Uh, so we're all on the same page, uh, making sure that everyone's aware. Uh, a lot of our community, each person is working kind of in their own silo. So I think if we had more of a a community uh, group then we could kind of share uh, resources because um, we're all it's all the same problems but everyone's working in, in silos so uh, I think it just needs to get back down to a uh, good community effort um, guys listen like I said we could we could have fun we could chat uh, all day long here as long as uh, Sorensen's connection lasts but uh, this has been good. Uh, thanks for uh, coming and sharing what life's like for you guys um, as we get to know kind of the, the people in our neighborhood here in, uh, in Woodstock and, and in our Carleton County. Thanks for all you guys do. We greatly appreciate you guys. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for having us, Neil. All right. Thank you guys for just being real with us tonight, for sharing uh, what life is like as a policeman what made you want to do it, what keeps you in there on the tough days, how you face criticism, all that kind of stuff. And I just want to say that uh, we appreciate you and all that you do for our area. Next week, we are having four uh, helpers join us. Joel DeMerchant from Harvest House Woodstock, Heidi, my wife, from Valley Family Resource Center, Sandy Olmstead from Valley Food Bank, and Rebecca Buber from Sanctuary House four very important helping agencies that exist in our town and they're here to talk about themselves a little bit and what their organizations do to serve people in need in our community so i hope you'll join us same time same place grab a cup of coffee sit down and uh, just um, sing along who are the people in your neighborhood maybe you want to get to know somebody maybe this inspires you to step outside of yourself and uh, just talk to people and listen to who they are. 
For now, thanks for joining us tonight. It's been great to have you, and we appreciate the support. We'll see you next week.